Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Jennifer Schrepsel is here to talk to us about the Baden-Württemberg area in Germany. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent. And um, I will say, moving forward, do pardon any of my German mispronunciations. I took, did take German a long time ago, and the last class I took was not conversational German. So um, we'll do our best. And um, what you're seeing is a bit of a retrospective, of course, with COVID, a lot of us can't travel or it's a little bit trickier. This was from a trip in the summer of uh, 2017 that I took with my sister. And as you can see, we were a little bit out of the particular state of Baden-Württemberg. However, um, most of the time was spent there and it's a little bit of a feature what you can see by traveling by rail. Um, and as I said, boat and foot. Um, there were planes, trains and automobiles in there, but some of those were more just getting to the country. So um, anyway, this is Baden-Württemberg, as you can see, is one of the land or um, states in the southwestern part of Germany. And um, I would have maybe done things a little bit differently now that in the future I knew about how easy it was to travel by rail because I did actually have a, an uncle who was stationed here and um, it would have been actually a lot easier to get to where he had been stationed but not knowing how to get around and all of that and it was not really close to a lot of built up areas um, you know, I, I, we didn't do that. So we did visit three other Linder during our particular tour and we'll walk through those. Um, you don't have to look at the whole map. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Germany does have a really great railway uh, system. And um, as a Canadian, you can get a rail pass with unlimited travel. There's different packages. And I got one, I think it was five non-consecutive days within the month. You can spend a little bit less and get one that's like that more consecutive days, um, but it allowed you to move around. And so all we really needed to know was where we were staying each night and then we could decide where we wanted to explore. And um, I'm gonna get into a little bit about the types of trains and train routes because I learned something to stay away from unless you really want the slow route. We actually started in Heidelberg um, and the only thing I knew about Heidelberg really was from my mother's recording of Mario Lanzo belting out um, the student prints. And so, and then it was, it had been set there. So I figured, well, there must be princes or something somewhere in the history and there was. And Heidelberg is just a gorgeous, gorgeous city. Um, you could just walk around and that's what I did for a few days. My sister was actually in a conference and there's flowers everywhere. I still wonder what this plant is. It looks like it's a bit of dreadlocks, but um, you could just walk around. Even the fences have flowers on them. So it's like flowers with flowers. Um, it's quite old. We didn't really go, at least I didn't go into the newer part um, of, of Heidelberg, but it's certainly, you can see it's quite compact. You can also see quite a few crowds in there because it is quite popular. And, um, and so one thing Heidelberg's really famous for is the university. And um, the, some of the tour guides were students. So they kind of earned some money by that. And I think that's somebody who we hired, we had a tour guide for certain and we think he was a student. But um, the, the university is was founded in 1386. It's Germany's oldest university. It's actually the Ruprecht Garl University of Heidelberg. Um, and it's one of the world's oldest surviving universities. There's been 33 Nobel Prize winners affiliated with the university. And some of the famous alumni, I'm gonna pull this up, are Robert, Robert Schumann, the composer, um, reformer Philip Melanchthon, the philosopher Hannah Arendt, um, Somerset Malham went here, and um, they actually have, of course, a lot of 
royalty, especially in Germany, but also like Constantine I of Germany went here, it has infamous um, alumni, as you can imagine, Goebbels went here, but also Helmut Kohl went here, the former chancellor. And so the library is um, quite large. It has a lot of books, apparently one of the larger ones in Germany. And uh, you can tell I had sort of this Harry Potter-esque kind of feel, I guess, to it. But um, the thing I loved about it is you can tell it's a university, there's bicycles everywhere. And uh, inside the library, it is quite pretty too. You can go in and take a look. We didn't do much going inside because I mean, it was such lovely weather outside. And as a university, it does have fraternities. And this is a frat house, um, not one I usually see. And this one really has that Harry potter kind of feel to it, but it's another fraternity. Um, this one is a look of the, um, the rat house or the town hall. So it's down there. It's a little bit newer, as you can tell from some of the other buildings. And uh, this is the Civic Center. So this is the step back and there it is. So it looks quite picturesque, this little um, Civic Center and it's right down on the river. So quite pretty. I just loved, loved running, walking around, taking pictures and um, that's all, you, it's very free. Just take some um, work looking around. There's little plazas and there's also a few interesting sites. So this here, um, I didn't take pictures inside because I didn't know five years later I'd be doing a presentation, but this is the birthplace of the first president of the Weimar Republic. So that was the, um, the group that were building the, rebuilding the country after World War One, And um, you have the oldest church in here. Um, you'll see a lot of churches that I, I dragged my sister around from church to church. But this parts of this tower date from the 12th century. And so this is the oldest one in Heidelberg. However, it has some other churches. It's a little bit more famous. This house, the House Zum Ritter, was built in 1592. Now, Heidelberg went through quite a stormy phase. And this one is the only townhouse that survived the fire in 1693. It's now a hotel, so you can stay there if you would like. Um, and here's a church. It's a Jesuit church. It's built between 1710 and 1759. You can see it's quite Baroque looking inside it, or Rococo or whatever, but it is quite beautiful. It has a college attached to it. And... Um, and even this organ apparently is quite famous. I, I had a magazine, they were showing like, you know, um, organs around the world and this one was featured. So I guess it's famous to some extent. It has a lovely garden. Again, flowers everywhere in Heidelberg. And um, we finally got to take the look in because the first time we went by, there was a, a wedding going on. So of course, you know, quite a lovely place. It looks like to have a wedding. The most famous church is this one, the highly good Oh, Heilig, Heiligsgeistkirche, sorry, Holy Ghost Church. It was the university church. It is the burial place or was the burial place of the electors who were the ruler, rulers in this area. And interesting enough, this was actually for a period of time, both Catholic and Protestant. And there was a, um, a partition right down the middle of the church so that, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants each had their half of the church. So that's how they dealt with it because it was, again, the university church. So it was built 1398 to 1441. You see quite a lot of color inside of it. And this, but the stained glass windows, as you can tell, are not from that time. Um, as you can imagine with World War II, um, this glass was a little bit delicate. So even if the place was not bombed itself directly, the vibrations would have damaged the uh, windows. So some churches try to recreate the existing ones. Some of them were saved. Some have new ones. And of course this one does. One thing, if you travel Germany, um, they often will have organ concerts. We went to one here. Um, I love how these look like little trumpets heralding things. And um, so it was lovely to, to have a chance just to hear an organ concert about whatever in this, this church and it's just the way to hear a pipe organ. This is the old bridge. Um, 
although it's the new version of it, because it was destroyed in World War II and rebuilt by 1947. But if you travel across this old bridge, you get to what's called the Philosophical philosopher's walk, pardon me. You may notice there's a path here, and I guess the university, the philosophers, the professors would go and ponder big things as they walked around here. And um, you may notice even the palm trees. It's quite a warm place. It surprised me how warm to see palm trees kind of so far north and um, in Germany. But there's quite a lot of uh, very expensive house, houses over here. So um, this area, though, has inspired poets and whatnot. And uh, as we're walking around, of course, you want to stop. There's quite a few places. This is a little pastry shop that we stayed in, um, we stayed in, we ate in. And um, so, it, you know, even inside those buildings, it's so picturesque. But the really um you can also take boat rides we did not do this but you can take a boat dot ride down this Nakar river and uh, lovely things the most famous site is the castle um as you can see they were doing some reconstruction um you'll see pictures because they're constantly older things have to re um, do some um just maintenance to make sure Heidelberg Castle is by far its most famous site, and it was one of the most beautiful German Renaissance palaces. You can get there by walking up a hill. Um, there is a tram. We did walk up. It's actually not that bad a walk um, because it's sort of halfway up the hill, but it is really, really just gorgeous, even if it's in ruins. Um, it's a large complex. It was built between the 13th and 17th centuries. And the rulers of the area, the Palatine House of Wittelbach, lived here. It was destroyed in the Thirty Years' War. There was a war with France in 1689, a lot of burning going on. And there was also a couple of lightning strikes in 1764. So that really finished off this particular castle. Um, as you can see, some parts are more in ruins than others. The court actually moved to Mannheim um, in 1720 and, um, and then later joined up with uh, Bavaria and moved the court to Munich. But parts of this building were used to build other buildings. So, um, you know, it, not just war, but some neglect or whatever. This is the entrance way you would take to get into this complex and, um, you know, up through here. And as I said, it's huge. I think you can get a sense of this is just part of the inside. There's actually more <laughs> than just this courtyard that you can go into and see. Now, I just want to stop here to talk a little bit about the electors because they'll be coming back throughout the presentation. And the electors voted who would be the Holy Roman Empire. The um, elector Palatine was the chief secular prince of the Holy Roman Empire, and this was his palace. Um, and, and so Frederick V, one of these electors Palatine, married Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I of England. And um, one of the Holy Roman Empires decided to change where it was like, okay, you can stay Protestant um, prince, but he wanted everybody within his realm to be Catholic. And the princes did not take this so well. And um, one place, Bohemia, wanted to break away it was because it was Protestant. And this particular elector prince, uh, he, he took over the crown there. That sparked this war from 1618 to 1648, where over 8 million people died. And um, so this it really it changed the face of Europe, actually. But there was a, so of course it was destroyed, but there's a French calm who um, saved this particular place that the people in, in Heidelberg wanted to tear it down. He said, oh no, it's beautiful. So during the 19th century, he did some renovations. I didn't take many pictures inside, but you can see it's kind of quite pretty. It doesn't look very destroyed. He lived here for a period of time. So some of the buildings are restored. Um, this is the Frederick's Brow. And it has a very fanciful gene genealogy on the back, all the way back to Charlemagne. Um, I'm not certain the elector's real 
lineage went back there, but everybody had to say, you know, they were back to the, the, uh, the empire, empire, emperor. And um, there is this astrological clock. I just found it as interesting. This, although it is quite destroyed, is still considered a very important part, um, an example of the German Renaissance. This is the Ottenreich building. And um, as you can imagine, it's so beautiful that it became very popular. And I just thought I was, you would expect to see cows, but there were cows on, the, on this particular thing, uh, complex. There's also this giant beer vat. Um, you can see you can walk up and over it. I'm not certain how temperature controlled they can make it. I would think it would be not the best beer, but anyways, this giant beer one. And um, you can tell just the look of it. It's so beautiful that the romantics loved it. Like Turner painted it. Hugo was here. Go to like, there's just lots of things. And um, has beautiful gardens at one time. Actually, the prince took away their artillery area and put in a garden for his wife, the um, Elizabeth. She probably wasn't helpful during the war. But anyway, so that was Heidelberg, and um, we're going to move on to Tübingen, and I might have to go, go through a little bit more fun, quickly, but uh, that sort of sets the stage because this will be coming back a bit, this 30 years war. Tübingen is, um, I didn't take very many pictures of this place, but it's also very pretty. It's also a university town, um, but it does have original half timbered houses because it wasn't bombed during World War II. It had less things around it. This is one of the university buildings. It used to be a, um, a uh, assembly hall. And it was, this university was founded in 1477 and includes Hegel, Kepler, German chancellors, 11 Nobel laureates were re related to it. So there's a lot of people. The Rathaus, um, Haas, the uh, town hall was built in 1435 with another level added in the next century. So it's quite picturesque a city and it does have a um, this you know astronomical clock which is supposed to be famous and all of this. There is also um, a collegiate church and that was born built in 1440s and it was one of the first to convert to Luther's church. So um, this obviously became more of a Protestant university at one particular point. I didn't take any pictures because Make sure you wear comfortable shoes. I ended up with blisters on the bottoms of both my feet. I went on a little side trip and wasn't very picturesque, but could walk around very much. So I want to talk about the types of trains in case you um, happen to travel there. And um, Germany has different types of trains. The S-Bahn, you might see in there where it is, it goes from a larger city to the suburbs. So S is like suburbs, basically. The IC, are intercity, so it goes between key cities, but makes some stops. The RE are regional ones, the regional express. So it's the regional places to the large centers. Um, and then RB, regional block. <laughs> I took this back. It's, okay, so the good news is you can see some scenery like this, which is I not the best picture, but it gives you an example. You can see some scenery. scenery. Bad news, very, very, very steep. But there was a silver cloud to my extra long trip, trip back. And, um, so, but I, I, I'll talk about just to give sense. So Heidelberg to Stuttgart can be about one hour or over two hours, depending on the type of train. I discovered this and I had to go for after Stuttgart because Tübingen is about an hour's um, train ride. So I spent like six, seven hours on the train that day. So needless to say, if you want to see the sites, consider the type of train because sometimes the slope route's not always the best. The silver lining is this place called Esslingen. It's just outside of Stuttgart, about 15 minutes by train. And oh my goodness, it was so beautiful. I, my, my sister, I saw her the next, when we joined up and took her there the next day. It is just charm everywhere that you look. And um, on the other side of this tower is actually the train station. There's a short walk and then you're into the Altstadt, the old town. And um, so there's this just, again, flowers everywhere. You might notice in the background that there are vineyards. Um, Esslingen is famous for its sparkling wine. 
And so needless to say, um, the allies, allies were not interested in bombing vineyards. So there is a lot of original um, buildings here and um, churches and everything. Again, very compact, very walkable, even with blisters on the bottoms of both of your feet and just beautiful, just beautiful. This is the town square. Again, traditional house half timber houses. So I went all the way to Tubingen because they said about all the half timber timber and it was um, say an hour's trip. This is 15 minutes. Um, you can imagine there is a Christmas market here and of course a lot of people come and visit. And um, just showing you again, this is actually on the way to that plaza. It's off to the left where that one is. There's this church. Um, there is this, the canals that go through it. I mean, just picturesque. I, I can't say enough, even if there's some construction in the background. So you can just walk through this, this, this uh, city or town or whatever it is and, and just take a look. And I mean, you get great pictures everywhere you look. There's even beautiful doors. I mean, these are wood doors with these obviously quite old and these carvings and, um, you know, just different features that you can see that might not be in a place that was, you know, a little bit more impacted by the World War II. It has a fort up on the hill. I did not make it all the way up there. My feet were starting to hurt by that point. So, um, cause that's the furthest point away from the uh, train station, but you can, I certainly would love to go back here someday and take a look at that. So it's actually interesting cause I found out it has three city halls um, or town halls. This one was the Imperial Town Hall, but it's now District Court. It was born, built, I keep saying born, built in 1746. And um, it's kind of interesting because it was built in 1746. The new one was built in 1748 to 1750. And um, so you can see the little cafe out there, which we ate at a cafe. I don't know if it was that one. And there's an old one. This one was built in 1422, 1423. And again, um, it was not impacted by World War II. So you get this real traditional sense. And you can see very similar to Tubingen, a lot less time to, to travel. And actually a little bit less walking about. So um, there's supposed to be about 200 tunes in this glockenspiel and this one I don't, we didn't really stop to listen to it. I don't remember if we even saw it. Um, this is not maybe the most picturesque, but I thought it's just so, just you know, the sense of living in the past. This is actually the state, the, sorry, the city archive, but it used to be a chapel, the Chapel of All Saints. Uh, Saints. Became the archive in 1610, so it'd be very interesting to know what they would have in those uh, archives there. And um, it has this gate tower, it's part of the original fortifications. Um, which were mostly removed in the 19th century to make way for the expanding, growing population. And uh, this is probably the most picturesque ice cream shop I've seen um, because that's what was being sold underneath. Um, but yeah, so it's just right there in the middle, we have this nice little tower. There were three churches in the, this little place, so we can get your fill for those. This is the um, Munster of St. Paul. It's the oldest intact Dominican church in Germany. Um, but I found it interesting. The steeple is made of wood. And um, I think there's some metal. Um, obviously, at the top, there's metal. Um, if you look closely, you would, might see that there's wires running down so it doesn't burn. But I was just thought, that's very interesting. They still have this wooden steeple. So interesting. And that's just the inside to give you a flavor of what it looks like. Um, so it, that one was started in, in 1233, but this one here is the oldest church. It um, has this bridge between the towers, which I would never want to go on. Apparently there used to be two at one time, but the one was removed in 1859. This is the third church. The first one was built in the 8th century and um, discovered later there actually is underneath an archaeological thing, you can see some things down to the, the previous, to, back to the 8th century. So if I'm ever back in the area, I definitely want to go back and I definitely want to take a look beneath because that's kind of my thing. Um, this one was built between 1220 and the, and the 14th century and it has a mixture of styles. So you can see that the nave is um, 
looks a little bit different. It's a little bit plainer than down at the apps area there, but, um, and it has this wooden uh, ceiling. So I found that really interesting. It had this wooden ceiling. Um, again, I don't know the full history, but um, it was kind of interesting. So the chancel was added in 1350s. The furnishings are late Gothic. It is a Protestant church. Um, but the interesting thing is it's not a great picture. It has a Protestant high altar, which apparently is unusual in the area. So I thought that was interesting. There is also a late or Gothic church. This um, a later Gothic church built 1320 to 1475, the Church of Our Lady. And apparently for the Schwabian, which is the area, Gothic style is kind of important. And you can see just how much ornate it is just by the steeple than the last church. And, um, and there's the steeple, just like that really lacy feel to it. The door, again, decorations everywhere, um, a little bit higher, but it's also just that airier feel to it. The stained glass windows date from the, um, let me see, from about 1330 and again, um, I believe that these are the original. Uh, it's not far from Stuttgart, but I, they must have saved them because they're saying they're from 1330. So very lovely. It has this inner inner um, bridge area, inner Ruka, and um, it's the oldest or second oldest stone bridge in Germany, apparently. It dates from the 14th century, although obviously it's had some upkeep during that time. And Esslingen was on a trade route that went from Italy to Flanders. And this was the, um, they, would, they would travel through this particular area. So I guess in keeping with that, it was a shopping area. Um, so this is just on the bridge itself. Very lovely little places to take a look at. And although that looks like a church and it was probably a chapel, it was a chapel that's passed. It's now a definitely a shop. I was inside that. I think that was the tea shop I went into. Um, but I also found it interesting that they have newer buildings in the area. They have this very sympathetic architecture. I mean, very evocative of those half timber houses. Just really, if you have a chance to go to Essling, and it is well worth the trip. It is just a pretty, pretty little place. And it, you may look like we haven't really changed, but Stuttgart and Essling are just so close to one another. So we're going to move to Stuttgart. Now, Stuttgart. If you guess from this picture what it's the home of, you would be correct. <laughs> I said, well, there's no guessing that it's the home of Mercedes-Benz. And in fact, this is the Mercedes-Benz Museum. We did not attend this. Um, there is also Porsche has its uh, base here and there's a museum. It kind of looks, museum looks like a UFO had landed and also Bosch. Um, I'm certain there's other ones. Stuttgart's very, ba um, very big, and very um, rich, and very important. There's a lot of headquarters but it doesn't have as much heavy industry as some of the more Northern um, places that you might think of. Um, you can tell us on the bus, we did take a hop on hop off bus, which might be advisable because Stuttgart's really spread out over these hills and valleys and, and everything. And so um, if you want to get around, certainly the hop on hop off bus is really um, nice and actually, I mean, it was a little bit corny, but it had a recording and it, it had a bit of a charm to it. And this hop on hop off bus, you would plug in your headset. And if you're going to plan to do that, bring your own earphones, um, definitely. But you could plug in and you would get choose your language. Um, some other ones we were on, I'll explain later, but one we, that we were on, it played German and you try to listen to your other language. So it was very hard to hear because all you heard was German in the background, um, which I mean, of course it's in Germany, but this one was nice because it also had the Swabian um, dialect or whatever. So that's why they didn't do German or the Northern German. They did more of the, the German that people might know in the area. So it was nice that you could hear your language and not have to hear, try to hear over a different language to understand what we're seeing. Stuttgart has, the, um, the very first TV tower that was built from reinforced concrete. This was built in 1954. So it's really a predecessor to the CN Tower. So I found that somewhat interesting. Uh, we didn't go there, but you, I think you can, I don't know if you can go up it or not, maybe not, but I, at least it was interesting. You can see it on the, the um, hill. Stuttgart was industrial. It was quite bombed, but um, this one is very kind of interesting. And I had to look it up. I took a picture and I was like, why on earth were they featuring this? 
So it's an industrial landmark. It was actually built in the 1920s. It was actually bombed during World War II. And it's so amazing that this did not blow up because it used to be held fast. Anyway, apparently it's now an exhibition space. You can rent it. Cristo wrapped it or something. Um, there's an ex exhibit here. So um, anyway, it's interesting. It also had surprisingly had like a Chinese garden. And apparently this was from a... Um, international garden exhibit. So there's these surprising things when you go to some of these cities that you might not hear about. And um, so, yeah. Now, Stuttgart does have a World Heritage Site. There's Corbusier houses that are in there. We did not go see that. Um, again, if I go back, it's definitely something I would love to see that area. But there's this plaza, this giant plaza in the middle of the city. And um, there's a, around there's a shopping area uh, and a few other things, but there's a few other plots, um, plazas, plots. Uh, the Schlossplatz is the largest. So it's bordered on one side by this Königsbau or a king's building. This one was uh, built in the 1850s, 1860. It became the stock exchange. It's now a bunch of shops, but you can see this is one side of it. On the other side is this. Um, this is the new Schloss or palace or castle um, palace. And I'll just show you a little bit of a close up of one of the buildings because it's quite large. This was started in 1746 and finished in the, eight, the 19th century, sorry. And inspired by French Baroque architecture. It's now government buildings. Um, you can see it apparently do some tours occasionally, but you have to be there at the right time because government building. And so that's at one end right across from the Königsbau. On next to it, uh, somewhat, is the old Schloss or Castle Palace. And um, this was originally built in 19, sorry, 950 and expanded in the 14th and 16th centuries, which explains when you see the inside, that looks very much like the Renaissance there. And it's now a museum. And uh, I just love this picture. I, even if you have people in the background, it just it evokes the, the old days, I guess, that way long ago. So um, anyway, it's quite picturesque. We didn't quite get there in time to look at the museums. And because we were looking at a lot of sites, um, you know, we didn't necessarily go to a lot of museums, but there are so many museums along the way, especially larger cities like Stuttgart. Just want to explain why there's so many palaces <laughs> besides like all that old drafty old thing. We need to build a new one that looks like French Baroque style. Um, there were a lot of different. Now this is right after the end of the Third World, uh, thir Thirty Years' War. There were a lot of little duchies and and principalities and and kingdoms and whatever. It was really divided up because Germany as a cohesive whole is actually fairly new, regardless of any wars and then, you know, um, like Second World War, whatever, divided up. For a long time, it was different parts. So there really are tons and tons of, um, of different castles and whatever around the place. And you, this may give you a reason why I understand why it's called Baden-Württemberg, because there was the Kingdom of Baden or area of Baden and Furtenberg, and so you put those together. And that little part says to be very up in the northwest there, that part of that was Heidelberg and it's just later back, so. Um, in Stuttgart, there are monuments around. Um, so there was quite a few. This was actually a, um, a dedication to the, um, the one king, uh, Prince, whatever, I think it was a king, who, and here's his statue, um, Wilhelm I, yes, he was king of Württemberg, so um, it was to celebrate him, here's him on his horse, and um, this one was back, Mercury, it was finished in 1598, I don't know what it was for, but kind of interesting, and there are also other more modern ones, apparently there's a Calder one that we walked by, didn't realize, this one actually was quite moving. This is the um, monument to the victims of, uh, of, not, of Nazism, basically. And um, a lot of places in Germany have what they call what they call stumbling stones. There is a little plaque on the doorstep that talks about, gives the name of people who were removed from that house during the Third um, Reich. 
And so this is obviously stumbling blocks here. And there was, it was, it doesn't exactly evoke memory, uh, as much emotion there as you're there and realizing, you know, this tumbling and whatnot. Schiller um, went to school and worked for a period of time in Stuttgart. So this is the Schiller plot. And um, if you're not familiar with Schiller, the poet, he, his most famous poem was probably the one that was then, was Ode to Joy, which was set for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. But this is also supposedly the start of where Stuttgart was, because it started as a stud farm. And that's actually what Stuttgart, or Stuttgarten is a, um, a stud farm. So anyway, there is also a, another church in the area. Um, it was uh, used the walls of an earlier church. This was built in the 15th century, renovated after World War II, but you can see some older objects survived. I mean, this is obviously a very old wood cart. I think it was wood carving, it looks like wood. So um, yeah, we really enjoyed that. And just wanted to show you because we didn't have one of these. We actually had some ice cream. Um, having ice is apparently there's a lot of, we had a lot of people eating ice cream during that summer there. But these were like the largest meringues I've ever seen. And you can't even get a picture of how big I've never seen such bar big meringues, but you can go around and get your little sweets during the time too. So after we left Stuttgart, we went to Freiburg. Now, Freiburg, we didn't go to very directly. Um, it be, you kind of sort of can, but it's that very slow route. We went all the way up to Mannheim and then down to Freiburg. And um, so Freiburg, the, uh, it, it's definitely a, it's a trip that's a pretty long, but it took about just under two hours and it's 132 kilometers or 82 miles. So it's actually faster to go up because you're on a faster type of, of um, train. And I'll show a picture of that type of train later on. So um, yeah. So the uh, Freiburg has a university as well. And um, it was started in, um, let's see, I think it was, Yes, 1457. It was the fifth oldest in Germany, but Freiburg, the place was started around 1120. This is the main tourist entrance to the Black Forest is uh, the Freiburg. So again, lots of famous alumni. Um, this one became more Catholic and actually it, there was some things to do with uh, uh, Louis the 14th and all of this and uh, at one point it was in danger of being closed because of um, Heidelberg University. So you can just see some lovely, lovely buildings on ground. So there's that newer building, which was a library. This is the Jesuit church um, in town. So it's, you know, again, the, the church affiliated with the university. So you just walk along and Freiburg, suddenly there's a, a, a building that's part of the university. That's just how it is. It's kind of so integrated into the particular city. Again, you can just walk around in the Altstadt and take a look and just see how pretty it is. Um, I just found it really fascinating. I was wondering what this was. There was this wine everywhere. Apparently it's wisteria, which was obviously not in bloom. So there's this whole street. There's wisteria all over the place, which would be lovely when it's in bloom. It's certainly nice and green. Um, I wanted to show this because I don't know this, what this actual building is. I try to figure out, but the, um, it has a city crest. So St. George is the patron saint. And then of course it's just pretty. <laughs> Even the chimneys are charming. Um, I've never seen a chimney look like a house, but there you go. The streets also were decorated. They have these mosaics, I guess you would call them. Um, I guess they are mosaics. And um, so these are some of the sister cities. This is the um, Battenberg coat of arms. So we saw these three lines all over the place. It has a couple streets have these canals. So they're pretty. Again, you can see bikes. And actually, this Altstadt, you cannot have a car in there. It's not allowed. Freiburg is one of the greener cities in Germany. And of course, a lot of Germany takes the um, you know, environment very seriously. However, Every, just about every street had these little brooks um, or gutters, sorry, going through here. And they've been here apparently here for centuries. It's not something new. Um, there's some sort of boat race down them or whatever. <laughs> but um, one of the famous residents complained about the smell. So Erasmus was uh, not happy about the smell of things going down these particular gutters. 
and talking about him. Russ has stayed at this particular house for a period of time, which is the, um, the, sorry, I just changed when I shouldn't have been, the house Zoom, okay, the whale house, that's right, the whale house. So um, it was built in the 1514, 1516, and it's now a bank branch. So anyway, interesting. Uh, again, some things is from the archdiocese, they're building the palace from the archdiocese. So um, this, this one's a music school now, apparently. There are towers. There's one here that this was a, a memorial to, this tower is a memorial to the witch hunts that happened and um, the Schwabian Tower. So the towers were in danger of being torn down. There used to be um, apparently five, I think it was. And there's, these are the only two remaining. And, um, you know, modern conveniences. So it was very interesting that the streetcar went right through the tower. So they adapted the particular tower to fit the streetcars instead of removing it. So that was kind of nice to see. The Merchant's Hall, really beautiful. Um, it was where they used to, merchants had to come and get their custom, uh, their clearances and stuff like this. This building was, I took a picture of it, had no idea about it, but it's the regional council and um, several cities, sorry, several houses were destroyed to make it, but um, it's been the refuge for people, but the Gestapo also were, had, were in here. So it's been kind of a very vast, uh, varied history. And I'm certain nobody would want to live in here right now because there might be literally skeletons in the closet or basement. And um, this is the new rot house. So you can, maybe you can guess. And the old one is right next door to it. So um, anyway, but you can... Um, go to the old rat house, rat house and get a, uh, the, the tourism office is in there. And there's the back of the town hall. We went in and we had some, um, some cake. And since you're in the Black Forest, we had not exactly Black Forest cake, but they're cousins. So um, you can see how much <laughs> whipped cream was on one. And uh, we didn't think about the calories. It was market day when we were there. This is um, one of, there's two sides to the market. This was more of the goods. The other side had more vegetable, um, vegetables and fruits and stuff, foods, that type of thing. But one thing that they do, if you ever go and there's market, it's famous for its rota sausage, uh, versed, it's red sausage. And so that's something to definitely take a get in there. A lot of what you've just seen was reconstructed because uh, Freiburg surprised me, it was bombed and I guess it's because to avoid troop movements. So um, the Munster right here in the middle, fortunately is largely unstate. And here is the Munster. The whole open um, steeple is one of the things that is unique about it. It was the first time that that ever had happened. So it's kind of important. And um, yeah, so here's just a different look at that steeple. So you can take a look at how again it is. So the one that we saw in Esslingen would have been influenced by this particular one. So I, I noticed that there were some changes in the stone and whatnot being used. And so where these towers are, if you notice that there's this more yellowy kind of brick here, a stone, that is actually part of the um, original building. So, um, or older building. And then the newer part is this reddish brownish brick. So um, I found that very interesting. You can, there's pictures and you can see the story, but I did notice that there was this change and I was wondering about the stone. And so it's always helpful. It's quite pretty on the outside, a lot of ornate stuff. Again, very ornate. Um, and this one was interesting because it switched ownership, but it was never owned by the Catholic Church. The people of Freiburg owned it. So, um, yeah. Now, the windows in this building were removed in, for World War II, so they are the original glass. You had to put them back in. And um, I found it very interesting. This one seems to be by the Baker's Guild because there's pretzels. So I found it very interesting to go to a church and there you see pretzels. So I thought, how German. Um, I thought that was, so I, I decided to keep that in. So um, there's also this Schlossberg. The original fortified um, castle was on top of this. Obviously, it's quite a ruin. That was over a thousand years ago. You can walk up there, and this, I don't know if this is part of that. There's this wall, you can, or you could take a funicular. We did take the funicular up. However, 
um, the weather is quite variable. It went from beautiful blue skies, fluffy clouds to just teeming rain. And so I got a picture of the funicular with the rain. Um, there was supposed to be a cafe open. I don't know why it was closed when we were there. It was, we were there during its open hours, but um, we had to go all the way back down because the rain came in. We really saw it come in. Um, and instead of being able to go for a short walk out into sort of the black forest, if you would. So I mentioned about other trains. Now, these are the type of trains you might want to take. Um, these are the Intercity Express. Um, they're not the fastest, fastest trains, but they're very fast trains. They can go over 200 kilometers or average over 300 kilometers per hour or 200 miles per hour. And um, so that's how we got to Freiburg so quickly, because what we did is we went from Stuttgart up to Cologne, but you have to go through Stuttgart to Mannheim, Monheim to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Cologne. And um, that's about 288 kilometers, 179 miles. And um, it takes about two hours and 22 minutes because you have the stops in Mannheim and, and Frankfurt. I can't remember if we had switched in Mannheim, but it doesn't matter. It's um, about 1.5 hours between Frankfurt and Cologne. So it's um, pretty fast. Um, you were you're definitely going over that 200 kilometers per hour in a couple of those areas. So um, you could stay in Frankfurt, easily take a side trip up to Cologne if you wanted to. Here is the train station. Now, we were concerned about luggage because we were moving um, from Stuttgart. We were going to stay the night in Frankfurt. And um, we shouldn't have. This has the best luggage system. Oh my goodness, locker system. Because other places we saw lockers. I mean, the digital display. This one has a whole robot. We said it was like the magic. Could take all of our luggage and stuff and, and for the day and we went off. And I was worried that we might not be able to figure out where the cathedral is. You have to try really, really, really hard to miss the cathedral if you're coming out of the train station because it's right, that train sta station's to the left and the cathedral is to the right. So if we're not, we say, I wonder where, oh, there it is. So anyway, um, it's about the best picture I can take. Again, it's also constantly underneath um, being repaired because that's all, pollution all that color on um, dark color is pollution and it, the tires are so tall I couldn't even get them in here um, there's a tree in the way but there's Cologne Cathedral and it is very ornate um, as you expect with the, the this uh, time of the Gothic period the foundation stone for this was laid in 1248 and it was built over various periods of time. It was finished in the 19th century, according to the original plans. Of course, it was affected in World War II, had to be do some restoration, but it is a World Heritage Site. Um, I know this is slightly to the side. Um, I, some of the other ones were not intentional. This one, I, it's very, very hard to get kind of like the floor to the ceiling because it's so, so tall. You can get a sense of just how airy it is. Um, and it's the one Gothic church it is the um has the highest height to width ratio of any nave in the gothic period and it's 43.35 meters or 142.2 feet from floor to the top of that nave so quite um quite high and the thing that scared me when i came in is the birds um the, the sorry the swallows nest organ you go in here to play the organ and you may notice you're way up close to the ceiling so this is not organ playing for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, it's stained glass is, of course, it's really famous for having all this light air. So I just had to do some pictures of just how light and airy it is inside, but it's extremely ornate. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but the top part is the adoration of Magi. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of adoration of Magi in this particular cathedral because in this reliquary that you can see up here is um, supposed to be the, the bones of the Magi. So um, obviously that was around what, what it was, this particular church. It was a pilgrimage site to see the, you know, the bones of the Magi and to worship here. So very ornate. I was seeing pictures of the cathedral before when I took architecture, but never saw the floors. So I thought, I'm going to show the floors because you see interesting things like, here is a mosaic with the original church that, the, that this um, particular building 
replaced. So it's kind of interesting. Here's one with a plan of the cathedral. And here's one being presented. I have no idea who this is. It's got the imperial um, eagle on it. So I'm assuming it might be an emperor, but I don't know. And I didn't stop to figure out their writing because there's some writing in Latin around it. But um, anyway, it's just interesting to see those. Here's another adoration of the uh, Magi. And there's quite a few artistic works in here, very important for that. So I'll move on. Um, we stopped at a cafe. This is a cafe that's been there since 1855. Um, it's right across. You can get a great view of the, the cathedral and this plaza. And again, the bombing, it, there's a lot of this area was affected, but I want to show another church. This is a church. This is after World War II, the bombing. It's kind of ironic that the statue in front is still there. This is Great St. Martin. Cologne actually has other churches and some of them are so lovely and they're actually some of them are quite important. Um, there are these 12 Romanesque churches and this is one. And so it's really, if you go there and interested in architecture, don't just stay, stay at the cathedral, to be honest, go take a look around. Um, here's inside the great St. Martin, of course, reconstructed. And uh, yes, yeah, it looks very different from the cathedral, but that's not a bad thing. Um, another church we went to was, this one was really, really interesting. Um, seeing Pantaleon, it, there was a Roman villa here at one time. And it, so it's been built at different times. It was a Benedictine, um, at, I think a monastery at one time. Has the ceilings. Again, it was due to some renovations at different times, but, this one was the burial place of the brother of Emperor Otto I, um, Archbishop Bruno the Great, and the Empress who was the wife of Otto II, and she ordered the construction of the original this facade that you see. So there's also shrines to some saints, St. Saint Alban, Morinius, and um, the founder of Opus Dei. There's another church. Um, so this was uh, just, I thought it was really interesting. It has a blending of different styles. This is the one I really wanted to go to, but in Cologne, we got a driver who understood hopping on a bus, not so much hopping off. And um, it's, we, after we got all, finally figured out where the stop was, we didn't dare get off the bus because we didn't know if we would be, again, trying to go around figuring out where the stop was. Um, and so this particular church has this octo sorry, decagonical dome. And this was the largest sort of dome that was between Hagia Sophia and Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, at least within Europe. So it's, it was kind of like the biggest thing that they could do at the time. So it was, I really would love to have seen inside. Um, as you're going through, you may also see other things. This was a church at one time, as you can tell. It's now an art museum, and it's incorporated the ruins. And you get to see other things. Like this, obviously, was built at different parts. Um, it looks like I see in that one tower, there's at least three different periods. It looks like potentially a building. You just see different ruins. This is a Roman um, a tower that you go by. So it's part of the Roman settlement, because course, Cologne was settled by there. You can see this fountain. It's got a legend about um, little people helping a tailor's wife, but when she saw them, um, they left the city. So all the people at Cologne had to do their work. And the city hall. So the city hall is quite famous because it's, it's Gothic. And you can see quite ornate on the outside. And um, it's also over the case, sorry, um, over a, um, a, a Roman area. And that was actually the uh, Praetorium. So the Roman government was there. There's now the town hall. We really couldn't go in because a lot of people were either getting married or having their wedding photos taken. Um, there were tour groups. So don't know what it looked like inside too much. So we didn't get too far with that. Um, I'm a little bit behind, but I also started, I don't know if we have to end a little bit early, but we looked through, we went to Mainz, we went to the Middle Rhine Valley. I'm probably going to go through this a little bit quickly just to get some flavor of some things. I won't go into a lot of the detail I was, but Mainz is the home of Gutenberg. This is the Gutenberg Museum. Definitely, definitely, definitely worth a visit, I would say. Um, we were also there during market day. Also, you know, take, take advantage of that. 
This is the Mainzer Dom, the, the St. Martin Cathedral that's there. It, there's three Imperial Romanesque um, cathedrals that are intact. And so they're combined like world heritage things and um, is built in various times, but it's, um, and so it's quite huge. And you can see it's a little bit simpler design. Um, I'm actually looking down towards the part that most people don't, but that part at the back, you can tell simpler, that's the more original part. And then there's a newer part in the middle. So um, you can go in there and just see the different styles. It was quite interesting. The, um, there's that a dome, it's octagonal. And um, so I just looked up here, the little parts, the pillars and whatnot, these, those were added later on, I think in 1200. And we got to hear somebody playing, they're warming up for an organ concert. So again, we didn't stay for the concert, but I do recommend those concerts. The um, Rhine area is, again, a World Heritage Site, this middle Rhine area. You can tell there's lots of palaces, ruins, uh, castles, and whatnot. Now, we went there, we could say we did. It wasn't the best weather day. Um, instead of taking the usual cruise ship, this is one we took. You can get on, you can get off, um, but the weather wasn't <laughs> conducive. So it is quite picturesque. Um, Again, you can tell your wine countries, there's vineyards everywhere. Um, and this is one place we started out. I was doing a picture of Bingen, um, which is where we started. And I really wanted to go there because Hildegard of Bingen, but discovered everything that she was there. It's all been destroyed pretty much. So whatever. It has this little cute little mouse tower. There's stories about um, an archbishop. There's supposed to be a legend with an archbishop who um, was, you know, murdered people and wouldn't share and food and whatever, and he was punished by mice and whatever. But it was used to extract tolls. Now, a lot of these castles were to defend territory of different people or extract tolls, which basically sounds like they were um, basically forcing people and to just give us money. So I'm not certain how much it was really like tolls as opposed to extortion. But anyway, the um, there are a lot of the, um, this is one that was actually built rebuilt in the 19th century because of romantic medievalism. And so there's quite a few of these that have been rebuilt over the time. So they have this real picturesque look. Um, this is one of the oldest ones on the Rhine, but again, rebuilt, it has a hotel in it. So you can go stay there if you want. Some have remained in ruins. This one was never <laughs> a good idea. It was, it ended up not helping out the person who built it and strengthening the enemies and French and Spaniards launched attacks from it. So it, it was never, so I mean, but that's why it's in ruins. Um, this particular place, Lorchhausen, is um, the gateway to the Rheingau or the wine region. It's considered that. It doesn't have an actual castle, but it is a little bit pretty with this little chapels. Both of these are from like either 19th or early 20th century. Anyway, so some places you can stop. Baca Rock, we didn't stop there, but um, apparently it's a lovely place. One of the electors, the Count Palatine of the Rhine, lived here. Um, it has some this chapel that you can see behind the one church. It doesn't have a, a steeple on it anymore. And there's the tower in front. There's a castle. It has apparently a lot. It's just really lovely. So um, it also has this, this is another place where you have a couple of um, of castles. The one in the back is um, older, it's a hotel, but the one in the front's interesting because again, it was to collect tolls and it was built between 1326, 1340, never fell to the enemy, which you would think it out there would be, but it never fell to enemy. And um, it even had to deal with river ice and there it still stands. It was, the walls were strengthened a bit and some changes made, but maybe for aesthetic reasons, but not because it was burnt down. So that I found this very interesting. Okay. We did get off at a place called Obervessel and um, we took the train up to a place called Koblenz. There were 18, um, apparently had 21 towers. It has 18 now. And it's also a beautiful place to rock around, which I can verify because we did do that. 
And uh, the church you see in the middle is the um, Church of Our Lady. It's old, apparently inside, and has beautiful altar and choir stalls. We didn't go inside. I didn't know if we could, but it certainly is quite lovely from the outside. And there is the castle at the back, again, restored in the 19th century. It's now a hotel. And um, it also has another church, this one without the rest of the tower. But the interesting about this tower is it used to be part of the fortifications of the city. So um, anyway, that's kind of an interesting thing. And uh, I definitely would have walked out there if in the future if I had time. Of course, you have to do Lorelei Rock. It's almost obligatory if you're on there. You can see just how... Um, how wet it got we were I could not be outside to take pictures quite so much we were inside having ice cream and then some of these were by also um actually I think that was on the train sorry this was on the train this is Bofford which I like the name of it but um there's some Roman ruins there and Marksburg so this is the only castle that was never damaged um and it's now the home of the German Castles Association, you can tour it and you can notice how quickly we're going by, but I managed to get at least the castle itself, not just a blur. And there is also a palace. Um, this palace was built by, um, well, it was built and then it was burnt down, but Frederick Wilhelm, who later became um, Frederick Wilhelm IV, he, when he was crown prince, he was given it as a gift and redesigned it and built this, this palace up and you can go in there if you'd like to see. But if you want to see castles, because of all those small places, we could have just stayed in Baden-Württemberg. But, you know, we can now say we went down the Rhine River, we saw Laura Lai Rock. Um, but, yeah, so if you just want to see castles, you actually don't have to go all the way up to the Rhine. Because you have to go through Mainz, it's a bit of a trip. So this was not something maybe more for a day trip, because you kind of want to stop and take a look at some of these places. I'm almost done. The last place is Frankfurt online. So um, Frankfurt it sometimes gets sh short shrift because people are like, well, online is bombed. And it was very much bombed during World War II. Um, but it has so much to do. We really enjoyed this. Um, it is nicknamed Minehattan because of the Mine River and because of the skyscrapers in it. And I thought this just capture um, Frankfurt so well. It's got the modern, but then it has old or old style at least, just alongside of it. So it's quite interesting. It's a very diverse place. There's a lot of people are migrants in there. So apparently food's like great. We didn't go up here, but there's this outdoor observatory. It freaks me out a bit, but you can take a look over there. Um, Frankfurt is the home of the um, Central Bank, uh, the European Central Bank. So that's what this is. You cannot tour it, of course. Um, <laughs> that would be suspicious. So it has major newspapers. There's the German National Library. Um, major banks are headquarters here. Again, it's a major city. It also was very destroyed during World War II. Um, I'm going to, I know this isn't a great picture, but I had to get one I could share. And I will do a feature, a couple of things, because I see this as, Frankfurt as the resilience after um, after World War II. They rebuilt a lot, but sometimes things are simplified. So this is kind of interesting. It's got some details, but some things are simplified. So, but it makes sense. You know, um, we have methods of making houses, you know, less drafty, more, you know, greener and that type of thing. So um, there was a process of rebuilding and it finished just a few months actually after we were there in 2017 or early 2018, they finished it. So this particular place in the ring is St. Paul's Church. And um, this was the first thing rebuilt after the war because it has such a major significance for the German people. Um, so Frankfurt was a free city, it, that which meant it only answered to the Holy Rem Roman Empire. And emperor and that would make sense a little bit later on and so they're very um, proud of it but in 1848 the first democratically or first freely sorry freely elected German parliament met here and started the drafting of a constitution it was set up a constitutional monarchy it really did not work um, by about three years later everything was overturned by that, but it was the first chance to try to do a democracy or, or some sort of um, something other than just having nobility over you. So um, it's now a meeting place. Um, the inside was definitely changed and simplified, um, but the outside, I 
believe is supposed to be very similar to what it was. The tower law that was stick. It's so important. It's a GPS reference point for the city. So, um, and it also is where they have their Holocaust um, memorial. So this, this particular air plot and area is very important to the people in Frankfurt and to the Germans too. Um, I'm gonna show this particular church. This, there's some other churches. This is a Catherine church. It's a Protestant church, but this is where Goethe was confirmed because he came from Frankfurt. So um, it again was destroyed, rebuilt, but you might be interested to go around that. We didn't follow his path, but again, things to do future. There's so much more to do in Frankfurt. I definitely wanna go back. This was an interesting cafe. Um, I thought it was some things were very old. The carving at the top is, but it used to be a guardhouse <laughs> and a prison. It's now a cafe, so who knows? Um, this particular part of tower and building, it's um, in that area it was rebuilt. It's a history of German, um, of German history or something. It's a historical museum. Um, I believe they're also moving somewhat, but anyway. So this general area that you can see was quite destroyed. You can see a couple little pokey things standing up. Um, you might be able to see the church tower and um, it's this area. This is the Romerberg and um, this is gonna be like the last part where I'm gonna end, but in this area, as well as another plots over, it was very extensively rebuilt, as you can tell. Some a little bit more faithfully than others in the church. That tower was mostly standing after World War II. But the rest of the, the chapel was not. The church is this for St. Nicholas, so, um, you know, Santa Claus. And um, it used to be where the city councillors would go and worship. The Unfortunately, the fountain, which is quite pretty looking, was under construction, so we have ugly things up, but whatever. Because on the other side of this is the romper. And this is a huge complex. It's now nine buildings, it used to be 13. This is the city hall. But this is actually important about those Holy Ro Roman emperors because in this building um, or on the site, this is where the um, electors would go. They would debate about and try to negotiate who they would vote for to be the emperor because the emperor was elected in Frankfurt. So obviously to make it a free city so that that wouldn't sway anybody to any particular prince, that's one of the reasons it was. So um, Frankfurt was a free city from, we see it was 13, I think it was something like 1350, yeah, 1356 was the golden bowl, um, bowl up until 1806, which is when the Holy Royal Roman Empire was dissolved. So um, that's when it was, it was a free city sort of on and off in between, but anyway. So um, really pretty, this particular thing. The facade was mostly standing, that's kind of standing up there. It has a bridge of size, but this particular place, the Kaiser Dome. Now it's not really cathedral, but it says the Imperial Cathedral. This is where the actual election would take place. And um, from 1562 onwards, 10 emperors were crowned there. It, um, I see how many, 33 of the 52 kings and emperors were elected in this particular building. And you can see it's quite lovely inside, very, um, even with the reconstruction. I did not realize this is just the entrance to the chapel, that little door you have to go down and that's where the actual um, election was taking place. So ah, I got the seven electors, but, um, I have to go back someday and uh, actually go into the chapel. So this opportunities. There's works of art, lots of love, lovely works of art there. And I thought this one's interesting because it has that Romer, the townhouse, town hall in the particular structure. So um, anyway, the last thing, there's this embankment along the river. They have these walking paths, tree line, beautiful place to walk but they have a whole bunch of museums. It's just called the Museum Embankment. And this one's one of the crown jewels in there, the Stadel. It's an art museum. It was started in 1817 by a banker who left his collection in the house and everything. And it is a major art museum. I didn't take much uh, pictures from there in there. Um, I did take a picture of one. I just thought how romantic it, <laughs> you can tell romanticism with that, with the, with the uh, smoke 
uh, you know, circling, circulating up, but it has like a Vermeer in here, has uh, Durer, Botticelli, Rembrandt, Vermeer, uh, I said Monet, Picasso, Beckman, Degas, Van Eyck, like it has lots and lots. So if you like art museums, it's definitely a place to go. And that is where we will end my presentation.